。各位老师啊，各位同学啊，大家好啊！就是很荣幸看到这么多人来参加这场的演讲，来听这场的演讲。我们中国哲学外文治疗中心。已经办了好几场，这个好像是第九场这个外套。那么我们今天也很荣幸的请到这个澳洲澳洲国立大学的这个米夏尔·圣芬教授。那么他今天想跟我们呃呃介绍一下他的研究，他的演讲题目呃是 How to improve the comprehension of preaching ideas, the term Zhong 啊 commonly rendered as loyalty。那么，我先用就是用简单简短的方式啊，介绍一下他的学历啊，然后请他开始啊他的演讲。就是申伯飞教授，其实我,我认识很久啊，就是我们现在海德堡大学算是几乎是同学，他我的学长。呃，那么他在呃海德堡大学啊，嗯，主要是啊，就是跟这个胡德法克教授。啊，做了研究啊，就在这个 Rudolf a c h n e r 啊，做了经营的一个研究群啊，你啊研究的这个《楚辞》啊，这本、个、书啊，就是中国文学啊，《楚辞》啊，这个经典啊，那么呃，他的博士论文啊，也就是在研究《楚辞》啊，这本、个、书啊，那么，但是他的兴趣非常的广啊，他、啊、就是是一个可以说一个就是这个这个一个很典型的欧洲的汉学家啊，就是对这个经典啊啊，对。非常感兴趣啊，经典文化啊，这个嗯，但但是除了这个，除此之外啊，也对这个文学、中国文学啊、中国诗啊、诗学啊、中国的思想啊、观念史啊，甚至对中国的考证、考考古学，都有做了一点研究啊，所以相当的博学啊。那嗯，他在这个研研究完这个屈原的《楚辞》之后啊，就开始研究呃这个。或他的接下来的研究，比较属于这个政治思想史或者政治观念史啊，所以他对这个汉代的呃经典啊，都有相当的深入的研究啊。他的文章也蛮多啊，像在这个《Early China》或者呃呃这个呃类似的刊物上，或像《中国学术》啊，或者这个《Asian African Studies》的文章，嗯，那么他呃呃。最近的对，就是现在，就是我刚刚已经说他去澳洲啊，所以他是现在替代这个 John Macon 啊，就是 John John Macon 这个教子上啊，做做研究啊，做教学啊。那他最新的研究计划就是涉及到这个忠啊，忠这个概念啊 ，loyalty 啊，就是我们都知道，就是忠与孝啊，是这个来儒学啊，或者中国传统的中国的儒教文化里面非常关键的概念啊，也啊，但是我们也不如，其实是。不容易理解啊，就是这些，就像忠与孝这么核心的观念的的的的的的意义啊。那啊，这个呃，圣伯费利礼拜一啊，前天已经在台大哲学系啊做了演讲啊，来很呃、啊、很很很系统性的分析啊，忠经啊与孝经啊这两本经典的这个这个这个年代问题以及他们啊这这两本书的这个思想意涵啊，所以我很期待啊，今天。啊，更进一步的、更深入的，啊，就在帮我们说明啊，这个这个这个观念，对，对我就不多说了啊，我们就请这个圣德根尼的教授来开始他的演讲。谢谢您，马少教授，也谢谢呃，读物大学的负责人，就是给我这个机会在这里做报告。嗯，可惜我不敢讲这个土木用用用中文，所以啊。我希望，嗯，这在在这里用英文讲，呃呃，不不算一个很大的的问题。嗯、um, ，How to improve the comprehension of preaching ideas? Um, the term Zhong commonly rendered as loyalty. Classical Chinese contains a variety of expressions that are infamous for bearing particular trouble for translators. Though the plurality of meanings of expressions in any language is a given, expressions commonly rendered as wei, dao, virtue, de, righteousness, yi, etc., have a special status since they stand for central ideas. 
The understandings of these ideas, however, seem to vary even among roughly contemporaneous authors. While sinologists have devoted much energy into pinpointing these ideas, communication with Western philosophers is still hampered by the idea's cloudiness. In addition, for some Chinese expressions like Zhong, this process of understanding has only begun quite recently. This paper um, I'm presenting to you today is concerned with the ideas behind Zhong, a term that presently has the meaning loyal or being true, faithful or being devoted. Many translators of ancient Chinese texts have used the term accordingly. Though the rendering of the term Zhong as loyalty is still common, various scholars have rightfully questioned the appropriateness of this translation. Paul Goldin demonstrated that Zhong has different meanings, at least in some particular context of preaching texts. Wang Zijin is a somewhat typical Chinese representative of the idea that Zhong originally had various meanings that gradually became reduced during the late Warring States era to mean being loyal to one's ruler. Masayuki Sato holds that Jung always meant loyalty, but that this loyalty was originally directed towards the state or the altars. Sato also maintains that the concept expressed by the combined term Jung Xin, today faithful, today translation faithful and honest, loyal and trustworthy, for example, was considered to be essential for the continuation of states. Only later, Sato maintains, through the influence of early Confucian doctrine, it became directed towards individuals. The present paper attempts to go beyond these positions, arguing that the term stands for a set of ideas that include some of the meanings found by these scholars that contain Zhong in the Zuo Zhuan. Sorry. The present paper attempts to go beyond these positions, arguing that the term stands for a set of ideas that includes some of the meanings found by these scholars, but that loyalty is but one and only one aspect of this set. In a first step, some of the passages that contain Zhong in the Zuo Zhuan will be presented to circumscribe this set of ideas. In a second step, the conception that arises from this set of ideas will be put to the test in a survey of the meanings Zhong attained in the Lun Yu, the Mo Zi, and the Han Fei Zi. While I do agree with Wang Zijin or Masayuki Sato that the idea of loyalty as a meaning of Zhong appears to have gradually gained in prominence, my own research of preaching sources has led me to what can be conceived as two clouds of meanings of Zhong. The meanings gathered in each cloud contradict one another. And my hypothesis is that this embedded contradiction in Jung is what distinguishes the term as a central idea, but what is also responsible for the continuing difficulties in translating the term within a given text. Preliminary. Let me begin by quoting Christoph Habsmeyer. Every translation, however well-founded it may be on the necessary detailed grammatical and philosophical research, philological research, will inevitably have to bet a host of questions of interpretation. Translations are never evidence. They embody interpretations that are open to questioning. They are part of the argument and must be treated as such, with the appropriate critical awareness that there may always be alternative translations. The arguments in most studies by philologists, however, do rest on translations. Translations being a central part of my own argument, I had to find ways to arrive at sounder and probably more convincing interpretations. As a consequence, I chose an approach that insisted that only a precise understanding of the particular context the surrounding terminology and the argument in which Jung was used would provide the particular meaning of Jung within this context. The consultation of a bunch of such contexts in one source would then lead to a group of meanings and similarities and differences between these meanings could be observed. 
Of course, you will object and say, look, this is the job of any serious philologist. But once you have gone through existing translations, you would be surprised about the degree and the tenacity even interpretations of specialists tend to rely on established lexicons, especially when they are dealing with terms denoting central ideas that come along with well-established renderings. The next question arises when we look at opinions regarding the nature of the classification of preaching sources. Based on the philosopher Raymond Goyce, my approach of the text is genealogical. This means A. I do not pretend to reconstruct the evolution of the meaning of John. Instead, I assume that any appearance of the term is but a snippet of possible meanings it concurs with at a given time. And B, I accept that some meaning concurrences or their precursors are irretrievably lost. I further conceive some of the texts under examination as results of compilation processes meaning that the materials gathered stem from different times and authors, yet were later considered to belong to a particular tradition of thought. This approach may sound naive, yet I do maintain that we still lack the means to chronologically dissect the majority of preaching texts convincingly. Besides, to conceive these text compilations as units doesn't preclude the discovery of variations in meanings of certain terms. Another issue is our understanding of loyalty. We need to know what we conceive as loyalty or loyal behavior in order to be able to compare concepts. Loyalty, however, is not exactly a term whose precision has merited its inclusion in philosophical dictionaries. So let us briefly define how sociologists, philosophers, and, other current, and others currently understand loyalty. Loyalty is a form of attachment of persons to other persons, groups or institutions. You don't have the slide in your handout. Sorry, um, I just made it today. The relation can be of a personal or contractual nature. Emotions may be involved, but the majority of scholars would rather speak of an attitude or inclination. Sociologically spoken, loyalty belongs to relationships built on trust, with the difference that, ideally, loyalty relationships can exist with hardly any trust involved. One can be loyal towards somebody else, even though his or her actions do not justify one's attachment. Albert Hirschman even maintained that loyalty only comes into play when someone opts for one side in the face of better options. Loyalty is dichotomous. One can only be loyal or disloyal like one can only act in accordance with the law or against it. At the same time, the degree of loyalty demonstrated towards different persons or groups may vary. Relationships built on loyalty are always combinations of effective inclination and calculus. My attachment consciously or unconsciously aims at some reward. Finally, Whatever the reasons for inclination towards persons, groups, or institutions are, they are one-sided and thus egoistic. This is a very important point when we look at John. What I estimate is estimated since it is ultimately expected to serve myself, my partner, or my country. This last point, the egoistic nature of loyalty, is suggestive of a group of statements contained in the Zhuo Zhuan that formed the basis of one rather common definition of Jung in glossaries and larger dictionaries. Unselfishness is loyalty. Wu si, Jung ye. Yuri Pines, or Pinesh, is not alone in his understanding of the phrase. Yet conceptually, with our definition of loyalty as egoistic in mind, Jung can hardly have the meaning of loyal here. Other statements from the Zhuang that contain Wu Si support this view. They gathered the furniture and other articles, forwarding them to the people without the soldiers appropriating anything for themselves. Or, official business is for official benefit, not for the recognition of birth or death, day, death days. When conversing about the state of Jin, he exhaustively presented the situation without any personal views of his own. 
right? So Husserl takes on a variety of meanings in these various quotations. The meanings suggested by the above passages are being honest, being incorrupt, acting in an appropriate manner, or not letting selfish interest interfere in official matters. To link these behaviors with loyalty presupposes that the selfless behavior of the persons mentioned is caused by their loyalty towards their superiors. Due to the egoistic nature of loyalty we do know, however, this assumption is flawed. The only way to link these behav the behaviors of the persons in the citation with loyalty is to understand them as being true to a certain kind of morale. One of the two examples in Zorjuan that literally link Wu Si with Zhong involve a certain Ji Sun Hangfu, posthumous name Ji Wen Si, grandson of the founder of the Ji Sun lineage and temporal head of the government of the state of Lu. We become witnesses of the scene when the grand masters of the state of Lu enter his residence upon his death. I quote, when the Grand Masters entered the palace, or the place for his coffining, the Lord, Ji Sun Hang Fu, was in his proper place. Among the equipment of the house that had been arranged by the servants in preparation of the burial, there were no ladies dressed in silk, no horses fed on millet, no stores of fine metals or jade, and no valuable objects ready to be provided. Based on this, the gentleman realizes the appropriateness of Ji Wenzi towards the house of his marquis. To serve three dukes as prime minister, without accumulating anything for himself, could this behavior not be called appropriate? Principally, translators would find no reason not to render Zhong as loyal in the present quotation. Quite possibly, Ji Sun Hang Fu, though being a member of the ruling Ji Sun family, is lauded for his true service. Yet it does appear that the central argument of the entire passage is the fact, or is rather the fact, that Ji Sun Han Fu did not exploit his high position to amass riches. In this sense, he behaved appropriate with regard to his position. There are further examples that have been conceived as expressions of loyal behavior, but that rather appear to conceive Zhou as a concept. For example, the criticism by Jilian of the Duke of Sway, who reprimanded, um, reprimanded for masking his bad, who is reprimanded for masking his bad rule with lavish sacrifices. I quote: "What is meant by being well ruled is to be sincere towards the spirits by fulfilling one's role towards the people adequately." As superior to contemplate how to benefit one's people. That is to fulfill one's role adequately. Previously, some scholars have regarded this passage as an example of reversed loyalty, a ruler being loyal to his people. A consideration of the entire passage, however, clearly indicates that the ruler mentioned behaved inappropriately by indulging desires while his people were starving and by deceiving the spirits through presenting sacrifices that suggest suggested the well-being of the state. In the next example, a person by the name of Yu Pian employs a proverb to prevent his fellow men from taking revenge by killing the family of an enemy they are supposed to accompany into exile. I quote, Kindness and resentment towards opponents does not reach their descendants. This is the principle of appropriateness. To do harm to official matters out of personal reasons is not appropriate. Though its second part could be understood as a breach of an official order out of personal motives, and thus as a disloyal act, the Wu Si examples above already suggested a different meaning of acting incorrectly. The proverb refers to the rule that you cannot hold the children responsible for the deeds of their fathers. Against the sad Chinese tradition of liability of entire families, Yu Pian holds on to a principle of correctness, of appropriate behavior with regard to certain moral standards. And, even more important, he speaks of a mode of behavior, Tao, a concept of Zhong, where the ruler expressed by his initial proverb falls under. 
that the term Jung does represent such a concept is also suggested by the following passages. In the first example, a certain Cao Gui asks the Duke of Lu what encourages him to fight against the larger state of Qi. Only the last of three answers satisfies Cao Gui, who, at who attests that the will to pass correct or fair judgment counts among a group of behaviors associated with being Jung. <coughs> the Duke said, I quote, in all matters of legal process, whether small or great, although I may not be able to investigate them thoroughly, I make it a point to decide according to the real circumstances. Cao Gui answered, this conduct counts among those attributed to adequate fulfillment. You may venture a battle, one battle on that. When you fight, I beg to be allowed to follow. Unquote. The text thus indicates that there exist various modes of behavior that count as joke. Moreover, this conduct qualifies the Duke for being victorious to a degree that Cao Wei himself begs to follow him into battle. In two other passages, 10th year of Ju Cheng and 10th year of Ju Zhao, Zhong is characterized as an imposing or excellent virtue, a Linda. In the first passage, the Duke of Zheng is taken hostage by the state of Jin. The Duke's minister, Wung Sun Shen, lays siege to the capital of another state to pretend that he is about to take over the position of Duke and to document his disinterest in the return of the true Duke towards Jin. His plan succeeds, but the Duke, upon returning to Zheng, has Gong Sun Shen executed. The Zuo states that though Jun is an excellent virtue, it must not be applied to persons unworthy for it. Zhong Wei Ling De, Fei Qi Ren Yu Ke. The second example is a judgment about sons of rulers that do not match the qualities of their fathers. We are told that the son of the exiled dictator Qin Feng, named Zhu Wei, received most settlements formerly held by his father and gave part of it to the ruler of Qi. The ruler held Zhu Wei in such high esteem that upon his death he personally pushed the cart with the body of Zhu Wei back to his home. Regarding his son, a fugitive at the court of Qi, Duke Zhao, Chao of Qi remarked, his Zui son could not sustain his office, and therefore he's a fugitive here. Appropriateness is an excellent virtue. His son could not sustain when he uh, it went in office. Unquote. It is important to note that both behaviors can be understood as acts of loyalty. Kung Sun Shen does not usurp the position of his ruler, but attempts to free him from captivity by all means. Zhu Wei's return of some of the settlements is literally considered as Jung by the rightful ruler, and Zhu Wei seems to be held in high regard, therefore, while his son is not. Put differently, Zhu Wei's action may signal a personal inclination, or at least a feeling of obligation towards the ruler of Qi. On the other hand, Gong Sun Shen's action serves as an example for the failure to decide who qualifies to be treated appropriately. This indicates that to be worthy of Jung implies a certain status. The son of Zhu Wei is unable to maintain this excellent virtue of his father and consequently fails in the position of a local ruler. That indicates that to act according to Jung is a necessary ingredient of some permanence for successful rule. Besides, is loyalty so rare at the time to be considered an eminent virtue? The source for our definition from the beginning, the second example that links Zhong with Wu Si in the Zhuozhuan may serve as an example. During an inspection of the arsenals, the Marquis of Jin comes upon a captive from the state of Chu, who behaves very politely in his presence and answers that he is a man from those of Ling, a clan famous for its musicians. But ask about his profession, he counters by asking whether he possibly could have chosen another profession. As to play, he plays a southern tune. Inquired about his king, he does feign ignorance. 
When the Marquis tells Van Wens about the encounter, the letter says, The true prisoner is a superior man. When he praised the occupation of his ancestors in his words, he did not turn the back on his roots. When he made music playing the airs of his region, he did not forget his old associations. When asked about his king by referring to the time when the letter was still a prince, he restrained himself not to reveal something personal. When he referred to two famous ministers by their names, he honored his lord. Not to turn, turn the back on one's roots is being attached to one's family. Not forgetting old association is truthfulness. Not to disclose something personal is to behave with integrity. To honor one's lord is to be diligent. Unquote. It is quite obvious that loyalty is expressed in various ways here. First of all, the captive from Chu is bound to his clan by his trade. His choice of profession is understood as sticking to his roots, as his playing a southern tune is conceived as remembering his old association. Both behaviors are understood as signs of belonging, and thus as expressions of loyalty, especially when being in the hands of an enemy. The reason why Jun does not mean being unselfish in the present text can be seen in the prisoner's reaction to the query about his ruler. About his ruler. He first tries to go around the Marquis' question by pointing to propriety. Only after being pressed, he reacts with a story about his king as a prince. The counselor both notes the captive's initial restraint and the nature of the second answer, an answer that avoids the slightest mention of something personal concerning the king of Chu. While the captive's loyalty is demonstrated again by the way he renders his answers, the attitude denoted by Jun is that of a person that remains whole, that cannot be divided or lured into disclosure. The information given by the prisoner is true. It stresses the qualities of the king of Chu by referring to his good education as a prince, and it does not give the Marquis of Jin the slightest hint about the king's personal character. Even in his being diligent regarding his king, the prisoner demonstrates his attachment. So I just missed swapping the slide. This is the same text again. And what you can see here, these are all the terms that relate to your loyal behavior. Right? And the only term that reoccurs again, Wu is a quality of this prisoner, which is later described as Zhong. Right? And the way he responds as a prisoner um, uh, suggests that he is Wu Si in the sense of being integral. This leads to the conclusion that though all four attributes attested to the prisoner indirectly point out his loyalty towards the king, none of the key terms does refer explicitly to this attitude. Jung here even acquires the meaning of behaving with integrity in the sense that nothing personal, wu si, is disclosed by the imprisoned duke. A tentative result of the present analysis is that Jung in its order rather designates ways of appropriate adequate or integral behavior, behaviors that are oriented in line with moral or normative concepts associated with the legendary kings or the superior men. The result indicates that even in lines, oh, I don't have this here, why? Oh yeah, that's just below. Um, that even in lines like Zhong Shi Ji Zhu Gu Ye, or Lin Huan Bu Wang Guo Zhong Ye, the meaning of Jung may entail much more than submission to the altars or even some early form of patriotism. I come to the next text, the Analects. Let us now take a look at the Analects. Lun, I apologize for constraints of time force me to be brief regarding the following examples. He see Lao's outright contestation that Jung in the Analects meant doing one's best and not being loyal has been followed by some translators like Roger Ames and Henry Rosemond who rendered Jung as doing one's utmost. Or Edward Slingerland who employed a low-key variant of being dutiful. 
Their redefinition of Jung, however, bears two problems. The single meaning they ascribe to Jung fits only some occurrences of the term in the Lundu. And more important, their translations do not do justice to the prominence of the term within the Analects. <coughs> Apart from being one half of the so-called one threat, Jung, according to Lundu 725, constitutes one of the four pillars the teaching of the Master rests on. The assumption that Jung stands for another central idea like humaneness and righteousness is therefore only natural. In the Lundu, Jung is used in the context of speech, government, learning, and friendship. In the context of speech, Jung has the common meaning of being honest. An example for the context of government is the story of the former premier of Chu Zhu, Lundu 519. Confucius considers his behavior of neither showing a sign of pleasure upon being made prime minister thrice, nor of regret when being removed from office thrice, as Zhong. Though Slingerland's rendering of dutiful seems to suit Zhuan's conduct perfectly, the point the section drives at is his ability never to cling to any position, not to let personal interest interfere, and thus to remain in Tibet. The Lunyu also stresses this point in its sections on cliques. The nobleman does not form cliques done. Examples would be Lundu 214, 731, 1522. He sticks to his principles without compromising them. The resulting independence enables him to leave all positions immediately in case his principles run the danger of being spoiled. This view is also supported in sections that speak of the preparation of disciples for office. While questions like carefulness of speech and action in order to avoid mistakes or even danger are addressed, ties between ruler and minister or any necessity of being loyal towards the former remain unmentioned or are even criticized during the example of Guangzhou in Lundu 14, 16 and 17. To demonstrate the status of Zhou within the context of friendship and learning, I take a shortcut with a look at Xin, another of the four pillars, Zhou often appears in combination within the Lundu. The meaning of Xin is illustrated by examples of carts without linchpins for their yokes or collars, rotten wood that cannot be carved, and walls of dung that cannot be plastered. Lundu 2222 and Lundu 510. Accordingly, Xin is understood as being reliable in the sense that we rely on linchpins to safely connect carts with animals, as we rely on hardwood to preserve the traces of our carving. Yet other passages in the Lundu suggest that the master and his pupils conceived reliability, Xin, as something far, far more essential. In Lundu 1716, Confucius distinguishes between the stupid men of old, who were truly state forward, and those stupid of his days who deceive others since they only feign stupidity. Confucius' interest in madmen like Jeju seems to have been triggered by a similar idea, namely that stupid or mad people by their very nature or due to their being entirely unblemished by any kind of education, cannot but speak the truth. Ludu 8.16 is understood in this light, if Ludu 8.16 is understood in this light, it reads as follows. The master said, who is mad but not straightforward, rustic but not plain honest, and who reveals his innermost feelings, but is not reliable, I do not know him. Confucius thus states that genuine immediacy or straightforwardness, plain honesty, and genuine reliability are either innate in such persons, 
or the consequence of a certain state they find themselves in. Here lies the reason why what may be called genuine reliability, xin, or rather the return to it, has to be taught, and why it forms one of the four pillars of Confucius' teaching. Before this background, it also becomes clear why Zengzi, in Munji 1.4, has to examine himself on three counts per day. In my dealings with others, have I in any way failed to remain truly integer? In my interactions with associates and friends, have I in any way failed to be generally reliable? Have I failed to master what has been handed down to me? Being reminded that Jung in many sections of the Lundu is used on an equal level with Xin, we begin to realize that the achievement of becoming Jung might be an equally arduous and difficult task. To reach a state through teaching and self-cultivation, of remaining unbiased by cunning suggestions, of overcoming one's selfish inclinations, of remaining integer in the realm of core politics, and of continually behaving in that manner requires hardly conceivable efforts. In analogy with genuine reliability, Xin, the range of conducts designated by Jun and the Lunyu, can be subsumed under the epithet of true integrity. The meanings of the terms Jun and Xin in the Lunyu thus appear to be much more fundamental and extensive, and in the case of Jun, vary depending on context. Moreover, the meanings of Jung we find in the Lunyu and the Zhuan appear to be related. The Morza. The Morza as a text is problematic in many regards, as you may well know. Its long editorial history that forces to distinguish between core and later chapters, its re re repetitiveness, but also its neglect as a source for or the estimation of its impact on earlier Chinese thought. The Mozi is, however, central as a source for meanings of Zhong, since these appear to have to deviate markedly from those found in Lunyu and Zuo Zhuan. Mozi's concept of mutual benefit through concern for others, Jian Li, and Jian Ai seems to have induced the idea of personal inclination into the notion of Zhong, a notion we have learned to be deliberately unimpaired by ideas of concern or inclination in Lun Yu and Zuo Zhuan. The Mods is also the earliest text to repeatedly mention the three human relationships of ruler minister, father son, elder and younger brother, relationships that later will be understood as equivalents, especially for especially filial piety, filial piety xiao towards the father, and loyalty zhong towards the ruler. The problem is that those examples that prove that the Moists conceive these relationships differently cannot be found in the core chapters. The canons and explanation chapters 40 to 45 are infamous for their very considerable textual and interpretive problems. Yet it seems hardly accidental that Xiao and Zhong were thought to be in need of explanation. To be Xiao means to benefit those one is closely related to. So the second definition is more complex, and maybe you will certainly or you will certainly criticize what I translated there. To be Zhong means in order to be beneficial, to compel oneself, to humble oneself. The gloss on Jung implies that a person deemed Jung by Moists subordinates for the sake of common benefit. The definition thus consists of one element of altruism and another element of egoism, both required for the promotion of mutual concern and benefit that, in the eyes of the Moists, ultimately generates personal benefit. The minister granted to be Jung by Mo Di is not the utterly servile servant. He is actively engaged. He acts out of the conviction that he and society will ultimately mutually benefit from the promotion of mutual concern. He strains himself in proving ruler and rule and deflects what may harm them. 
Yet we also find statements that the minister granted to Bijong should elevate the ruler and shoulder all burdens. In his work, The Chinese Ethics of the Axial Ages, Heine Rutz has convincingly shown that Mordes' utilitarianism is flawed, since the ruler, as the guarantor of this frail principle of mutuality based on self-interest, will ultimately define what is beneficial for whom. So, subordination for the sake of common benefit, Jung will mutate from submission out of conviction to submission as an obligation, and ultimately into the requirement to remain loyal. The younger chapters of the mortal, where the meaning of Jung cannot be rendered otherwise but loyal, seem to be an indicator for this change in meaning. It follows that the Moist had a considerable impact on shaping a meaning of Jung that comes much closer to our ideas of loyalty. The Han Fei. A look into the teachings of Han Fei, or the regiment of the first emperor of the Qin dynasty, might lead to the assumption that loyalty towards the ruler was absolutely essential for the realization of legalist ideas. Wang Zijin even considered Han Fei to be the creator of a new morality that elevated Zhou to the status of a lord. Masayuki Sato, however, also addressed those examples in Han Fei Zi that opposed the idea of loyalty, concluding that its author held two contradicting views of loyalty, an affirmative and an opposing view. But why would one and the same author maintain two contradicting views in a book attributed completely to him? For Han Fei, the ideal state rests entirely on a combination of laws, rewards, and punishments. I quote, the governing principle of a prohibitionist ruler is that he is absolutely clear about the distinction between public and self, makes clear the order that rests on law, and gets rid of self-interested favoritism. Unquote. To achieve and maintain order, the ruler as well as his servants have to obey, to uphold, and to apply the laws with greatest diligence and without regret. To be operable as a ruling principle, the ruler has to be intelligent since he is the only one to decide who among his advisors is honest or true, Zhong, and who is false or treacherous, Tian. Quote, under an intelligent ruler, officials do away with their self-interest and practice public-mindedness. Under a confused ruler, it is the other way around. This is why the minds of lord and minister are different. The lord raises his minister with calculation, the minister serves his lord with calculation. The intercourse between lord and minister, consequently, is based on calculation. Unquote. The relationship between ruler and subject is not based on personal relations. Han Fei precisely conceives personal relations as the source for techniques of those with false and treasonous intentions. Law becomes the means to get rid of cronyism. Instead, rewards and punishment bind subjects to the ruler, and universally applicable standards guarantee the subject to be treated according to his behavior and not fall victim to the intricacies of particular leaders or interest groups. Thus, the only loyalty that is acceptable for Han Fei is being true to the law and to the faithful execution of the services required. who exhausts, quote, his strength in guiding the law, concentrates his mind on serving the ruler, is a true minister, unquote. This formula that reappears in various chapters of Han Feizi seems also to be true in those cases that Masayuki Sato considers to stand for Han Fei's affirmative view of loyalty, like the famous story of the Battle of Yanling, appended to the first of the Ten Transgressions, rendered by Watson as to practice petty loyalty, and thereby betray a larger loyalty. In it, 
The wounded king Go of Chu goes looking for his marshal Zifan, who excused himself from battle claiming illness. King Go finds him drunk in his tent. Being thirsty during battle, the marshal had been offered wine by his servant. When Zifan rejected it harshly, the latter insisted that it was not, that it was not wine. The marshal finally accepted and drank, but being very fond of wine, could not stop drinking. In the concluding link, lines Han Fei uses Zhong in a way that cannot but be rendered as loyal in the affective and egoistic sense of the word. The servants Gu Yang's offer of wine was not done out of hatred towards Zifan. In his heart he truly loved him, and yet this was just enough to kill him. Therefore I say, those who practice loyalty on a small scale are the thieves of acting truly on a grand scale." Unquote. In light of the arguments regarding Han Fei's concept of rule, the first transgression is a reiteration of his view how ties between individuals tend to subvert and endanger the grand project of guarding the law, solely serving the maker of laws and executing his laws. A complete survey of the passages that contain Jung show that Han Fei emphasizes particular aspects of the notion of Jung we have already come across. Among them, integrity, honesty, or being and acting truly, and redirects them to the obedience and promulgation of the law, the rejection of serving one's own interests, in favor of those of the community, and the concentration of all efforts on the service to the rule. Conclusion. The term Jung, as illustrated by these and other preaching texts not mentioned here, gradually appears to be equipped with essentially two conflicting and contradictory group of meanings. To signal the loose connection between these meanings or semantic fields, the image of clouds may be helpful. The first cloud bears connotations like passing fair judgment, by being impartial, acting in a manner appropriate to certain standards or convictions, repression of self-interest, not letting personal inclination or needs interfere, to be integer, to be one, to speak the truth, to be honest. What qualifies this cloud is that the human qualities represented by the connotations of meaning gathered therein principally presuppose altruism. The second cloud holds connotations like submission out of conviction, being inclined towards others, emotion-based bonds like loving devotion, feelings of belonging, loyalty, and even some early form of cherishing the region one stands for. The human attitudes or qualities expressed in these connotations are more or less based on, according to the definition I had from the beginning, on egoistic motives. Could this embedded contradiction of meanings of Jung be responsible for the continuing difficulties in translating the term within a given text? Let me give a preliminary answer by ending with one final example from the Hohan Shu a source at least four centuries younger than the text presented before. According to it, a certain Bi Yun ultimately died for his frank criticism, Zhong Dian, of the Han Emperor. In fact, he openly questioned the Emperor's ability to rule, a lay's majesty, in the eyes of the latter. Other Ohio officials interfered on behalf of Li Yun, arguing that though Li transgressed the taboo of attacking the ruler directly, his actions were motivated by his being loyal to the state or acting appropriately with regard to the state. A rendering with loyal to the state would imply that Li Yun cared about the empire of the Han. This understanding is implied by Li's remonstrance that not only addresses this, the misdoings by those on the top, but also mentions the natural signs of disintegration. Li also is described as a specialist in prognostication, implying that he can read these signs. The understanding of Jung as appropriate behavior instead 
is not only suggested by the interventions of his fellow officials. Though they acknowledge the inappropriateness of openly questioning the ability of the emperor to rule, they all maintain that Li hardly deserved torture or even death for his act of honest remonstration. Those officials that offer to die with him <coughs> signal that the action taken by the emperor is conceived as a transgression of existing norms. The end of the biography quotes the text of the stele erected in memorial of Li Yun. At least the quoted text from the stele exclusively addresses the open way Li Yun chose to remonstrate and compares his behavior to the frankness of the madman Confucius admired. The text of the stele explicitly refers to the Lun Yu, alludes to the madman of Confucius, and thus to his idea of inner truth and of integrity examined above. This fine example may illustrate to what degree the meaning of Zhong oscillates between our contradicting clouds of meanings. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Isaiah, for this very interesting, very rich talk. You gave us a lot of, or presented a lot of evidence. And yeah, and at first glance, you were doing something very simple, like reading these texts, and like close reading these texts, but it's something we often don't do. Do not do. Either, yeah, we are, for, for, either we are all maybe too, too worried about or maybe we're influenced by modern notions and modern understandings of certain concepts, so a lot of scholars don't take the time you, you, you took to read these texts very closely and so and in a very contextual way. So, and, and what I find, yeah, I find this idea of the clouds of meaning very meaningful indeed and, and very interesting in the way how you try to disentangle these different layers of meaning. It's, yeah, very, very. Uh, Interesting, I think. Uh, I was thinking about this idea of uh, the, the, the do one's best, you know, this translation uh, in, which comes up in the room. You know, I think these two laws are doing one's best. I, certainly a neo confessional way. Stint. Because Jung yeah. yeah, often, and in Sami, they, they translate Jung as stint. So it's kind of doing one's best or doing one's utmost. Mm -hmm. So this is a good example, maybe, of how we often, yeah without knowing it, yeah, like reproduce later interpretations. So I open the floor and, and I'm sure there are many questions, so maybe, yeah, what does that mean begin? Thank you. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I think um, we explain or interpret, translate some uh, important concepts. Maybe we need to uh, pay attention to two different things. Whether uh, it is, uh, it, it can't be context sensitive. I, th I think most of people would agree. Also, it could be uh, theory related. Mm -hmm. okay. So maybe not all the people agree, but I think it could be context sensitive and uh, theory related. And I think that's uh, two different things. So I agree that uh, on the aspect of uh, context sensitive, the concept of zhong, I think it's got to be uh, you know, very ambiguous or the cause of meaning. But that doesn't make uh, zhong semantically uh, contradictory. You use very strong terms. In, you know, zhong seems to be very uh, contradictory, but uh, I don't know. Um, it seems to me I emphasize rather the second part. When we understand Zhong, we got to be careful that it's theory laden. So what really are uh, contradictory? I think it's not the meaning itself, okay. but rather where it is embedded in the theory. So there, we, we would, most of people will agree that uh, theory, different theory can conflict with each other or even contradictory. But they may use the same term. So what really happened there, it's not 
really about the meaning itself, but rather it's a theory. So, so uh, it seems to me we can have something uh, semantically, we can have some uh, common understanding of the meaning uh, of the uh, concept of zong, like you say, like uh, loyalty um, or something else. There could be a lot of different meaning. But what really contradictory to each other is the theory itself that uh, the zone, the concept zone embedded in. Mm -hmm. So that's my suggestion. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, but the, the, the first tiny remark would be um, that uh, we have a range of expressions, as you better know than I do, in Chinese that have these um, double, double mean, double contradictory meanings, these are the like to meet or to separate, right? Um, then the famous, famous, always, always, uh, always used on Western T-shirts, G, crisis or opportunity, right? These terms that, that uh, when you open a dictionary um, are frankly contradictions in the meanings they transfer. The point I was driving at with the theory I was using here is a different one because the only thing I want to do is to say I want to know where I stand when I talk about loyalty today because loyalty is a is a very fuzzy concept. Everyone knows what loyalty is because we all have it in ourselves, right? And everyone thinks, yes, uh, I know what loyalty is, but once you look into um, the history of philosophy of loyalty, you notice um, uh, that there are many issues at hand that don't, uh, that are not really obvious, and one is is this this egoistic nature. And I took this egoistic nature as an angle to say, come on, there is when we're talking about loyalty, no matter whether we do it um, uh, uh, in Western text or in Chinese text, um, it has a certain drift. And the important angle way you can fix this drift is egoism. Right? And then I come to this term of Jung and look at the context and suddenly realize, look, the, the behaviors that are described here have nothing, uh, do exactly the opposite. And that's where I land, um, this is not, not um, like, like building a theory on a term, but uh, simply having a, a roster, a, a, a basis that allows me to say, come on, here is something different at work. So, um, but without the theory, I can't make the point. Yeah, uh, thank you for the example or in the explanation, but like loyalty itself, it's not contradictory. And where the contradiction come from? Come. probably come from whether you think it's loyal to yourself or it's loyal to the others. So again, it's theory related. It depends on what your theory is rather than uh, loyalty itself. So that's what I mean. As a, a semantic part, I, I don't see the contradiction, but rather the theory that the concept embed in, they are contradictory to, to each other. So that's my point. Thank you. Okay. And if you want to reply or maybe later? Yeah, maybe for the fun. I, I, I must say, I don't really, uh, I cannot uh, fully get your points. But you are saying that two cows, they are somewhat in tension. And I want to add something to Professor Mee's uh, 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 opinion. Because, I mean, if you look at lawyer to what, the what there can be of different kinds. Uh, with respect to a person or on the, on the, uh, uh, with respect to the egoistic part of it, you can have something that, uh, uh, to, the, to the right. But if you are loyal to some, something else, then you can get characteristics that you list uh, to the left. So there is no contradiction, just the object of your loyalty can be different. Is that? Sorry, no. I would completely disagree because this, that's, that is, it's good that you're, you're adding this point to the discussion. Yes. The, the, once you find out, like when you look at the Lun Yu, yes. um, that it may be, according to my to, to this analysis, um, 
the, the, the pupils of Confucius were not interested in ideas of loyalty at all. They were doing the opposite. They were saying, because once you become loyal, right, um, it, it, it inflicts on your own shosha. So and this is the point when, when, you have, when you have a teaching that says, uh, and, and you, have, you have many passages within the Lulu, where people, uh, where some of his pupils try to get into positions, and he's telling them, he's saying, look, you can do your job properly, but do not get attached to this prince because, or to this lord. Because once you do this, and this is a harsh criticism by Confucius, um, you get involved in a way you shouldn't be involved as a room. And so this is this. You cannot, you cannot now like like simply twist around and say, okay, if I'm not loyal to others, then I'm loyal to myself, and um, because then you would turn the egoistic side right on yourself, which mm -hmm. isn't the point. The point is that you reach a position um, where you don't have any kind of inclination, mm -hmm. and this would be what at least to, to what I'm, I'm reading out of these Lundi passages and Zord, most of the Zordjian passages, um, uh, is exactly the position they try to attain. It is being without this kind of personal inclination. And once you are without a personal inclination, you are altruistic and not loyal. Do you give any passage that you can show uh, now? Any passage from...